Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have a great honor and pleasure of chatting with another one of our up-and-coming bass players in the community, Oliver Unger. Yeah, what's up? <laughs> All good here. So, Oliver, as always, you're at the beginning of the journey of music and on bass, but we always like to find out a little bit about how you got started in music and on bass. Tell us about that. I was listening to music a lot when I was 10. I started getting into, you know, um, a lot of rock and stuff. Uh, one of my favorite bands when I was when I was 10 was Kiss, especially, you know, Gene Simmons, right? You know, he looks crazy with the makeup and everything. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. I thought I was fascinated by that stuff. So, you know, I looked more into Kiss and Gene Simmons. One day, look, I was looking at like a Wikipedia page of, of what each member played. And I saw Gene Simmons he was holding a bass and, and I caught it the big guitar. Mm hmm. I said, and my dad was asking me looking at it, I said, you know, yeah, I'm looking at the sky, Gene Simmons, he plays the big guitar. My dad was like, you know, that's a bass. <laughs> so from then, from then on, you know, I associated Gene Simmons with bass. I remember it was the Macy's Day's Thanksgiving parade. Mm -hmm. And Kiss was performing on this like huge thing and it looked awesome. I was like, it stunned me. Yeah. And I went up to my dad in his room, he was sleeping, he was like dead asleep. I was like, Dad, I want to get bass lessons, right? And, uh, you know, my dad said, okay, you want to get bass lessons. If you still want to get bass lessons, tell me in like two weeks, and we'll get you bass lessons. Two weeks passed by, and I still wanted bass lessons. And so he got me bass lessons. I did bass lessons with this guy, Rob Holthouse. That would do his private lessons at, at my house. Mm -hmm. Doing a lot of, like, scale stuff, really simple stuff, reading, stuff like that. And then I ran into this guy, Charles Simon. He's the general manager of a school called Stages Music Arts Now, which is in Cockeysville, which has some great programs and stuff. Um, I started taking lessons with him. And I found him through a friend and, and you know. And Charles was, you know, he, he had a lot of connections. He was, um, he's a young guy. Mm -hmm. He's played with lots of people. He's amazing, incredible. So he got me introduced to this woman, um, Amanda Lynn. And she was like, Probably one of the first experiences I've had gigging with this woman, Amanda Lynn. Um, I sat in uh, with her and Charles, uh, my bass teacher, at my dad's bar. And it was, it was, I think that was my first, my first paid, that was my first paid gig. I sat in like two songs and yeah, no, but it felt awesome just to get paid, you know. Amanda started paying me more, she started giving me more gigs. I started venturing out, you know, to more people and now I'm playing with, with a lot of more people and stuff and doing some session work. And yeah, so taking bass lessons with Anthony Wellington, great bass player. Amazing. Yeah, I started when I was 10 and still going now. So, Very yeah. cool. So right now you're kind of a, a free agent as far as being attached to any particular band? Uh, right now, yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. But mainly right now, like I said, I'm playing with Amanda Lynn and her band. I also play sometimes with this guy, Mitch Traeger, who's like a local artist. He makes some really, really cool songs, kind of like jazz fusion-ish. Um, he's kind of Steely Danish. Okay. I play with him, and I just formed a band with my buddies, Sebastian and Bennett, my two friends. I like a blues fusion trio. We're called Graydon Reeves. You can check us out on Instagram, by the way, just at Graydon Reeves. So, yeah, it's really all I'm doing right now, but, you know, I'm looking for work all the time, and I'm doing some session stuff, and, yeah, basically Very a free agent as of now, yeah. Very cool. And are you doing any playing at school? My or? high school. I go to a magnet school. Okay. So basically there's like, you know, there's different art forms you can apply for. I go there for music. And we do a lot of digital instrumental music there. It's a, it's a digital instrumental music prime. Yeah, so I'm doing a lot of, of that stuff there. And we also get to play with other students and make songs. So yeah, there's, yeah, there's actually a lot of, a great deal of music happening at my school. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, it is one of the new frontiers, and a lot of bass players that we talk to, it's a bonus if they can do synth bass. Yeah. You know, so if you've got that, those keyboard skills, there are some tunes that will really twist up your fingers, but yeah. on a synth bass, it's a much easier <laughs> play. So. Right, exactly. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I make a lot of songs in my house. I have a MIDI keyboard. Mm -hmm. So I mess around with it a lot, but yeah, you know, I try to, I try to go as much as I can with this, with the keyboard because, you know, a lot of bass players play keyboard. Yeah. I mean, a, like all of every, every single one I can think of, they play keyboard. 
Mm-hmm. Keyboard's like the essential, it's the essential instrument, really. I mean, it has everything. So, you know, yeah, I try my best to, to play some synth-based stuff. Yeah, I, I agree. Synth-based is very important, especially in times of now where everything is made through computers and everything. Gotcha. So, yeah. And listening to your music, I was listening on your YouTube page, you've got kind of a combination of some solo-based stuff. Uh, across the universe and back particularly yeah. came to mind yeah. and you've been lately working on putting up some of the cover tunes and yeah. you're you're kind of i'm gonna say wide open because yeah. it's yeah. stevie wonder steely dan i guess it's whatever catches your attention at the time that you've worked out that that's what you're playing right the youtube channel i just started it because uh, obviously, I love all the songs I play on on the on the covers. I love all those songs. Mm-hmm. Um, I love playing to them. I wouldn't pick a song that I don't like. I love all of them. I try to pick songs that I guess show how far my musical range is in terms of what I listen to, what I play. Mm-hmm. Because some of the stuff on there is like experimental. Like like I have a Mr. Bungle video on there. And that music's insane. It's like metal. It's really weird. But at the same time, like you said, you know, I have um, Steely Dan on there, some Stevie Wonder. So yeah, and with the original material, I think it's great to put original ter- material and mix covers with it because what I see a lot now, especially like on social media, is bass players putting up covers, but they're not really showing what they what they can do compositionally. And I think that's key, especially if you're a young bass player, to, you know, to success because it, uh, there's a lot of bass players that can play Steely Dan song, you know? Oh, yeah. There's lots of bass players that can play Stevie Wonder song, and they can play them great. But not a lot of them are able to compose. And I think, like I said, that's a great aspect to have, especially at a young age, because it impresses people that I try to do a combination of both for that reason. Well, and it, it is an important skill, especially you, I think you're hitting the nail on the head because you are at an age where your learning potential is like at its max. You're like a giant sponge. Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. Soaking like, up stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's what. Yeah, that's one of the great things I think about starting out music young. Mm-hmm. It's like you're like a sponge. You retain information. You hold. You hold on to it for a long time. You don't really forget it. And as you get older, you know, people. You, you tend to see that people don't get. If you're playing bass from ten, if you start at ten, mm-hmm. you're twelve. There's a big difference. Yeah. There's a huge difference from just taking lessons and practicing. And then you know, but if you're if you're like forty nine, then you're fifty one. There's not really a big difference, and it's you know, and it, like like exactly what you said, we're like a sponge. Yeah, we're able to understand information faster. And I think it opens you up to also some of the other options, like with the electronics and right. uh, a, a big thing that we're seeing is like band directors that are, and actually they, they end up being musical directors a lot of the time because yeah. they understand the composition, but they're able to work with like the programming Ableton or they can work with a uh, synth bass or they can play the string part and or they can jump in and do some other things a lot of it's just because they have that wide platform granted right. there are people in their journey that found a niche early on and they did that successfully for 40 or 50 years but so many of them are still working at learning as well it just doesn't come as easily as it does to young people so You'll yeah. never stop learning. You're going to have to keep on evolving. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, that's that's one of the great things about playing music when you're young. There you so, go. So yeah. moving on to your particular sound, and it's not just because I see the bass behind you. Tell us, how are you getting your sound gear-wise? What are you playing on? Well, my primary bass is a, a Getty Lee Signature Fender Jazz bass. Mm-hmm. There was only like 100 of them made, or, or maybe 150, something like that. So it was very... Very cool that I was able to get one, and like I said, yeah, it's my main bass. Um, but I also play uh, a, a new bass that I just got is a Fender P bass. Mm-hmm. It's a '50s reissue with flat wounds. And you know, in terms of amps right now, I use a Mark bass combo, two speakers. Yeah, and I, I love it. It can do a lot of things. It's really power. It's really light too. It's really light. But it's really powerful. It's like that gets really loud. Yeah, I love and. I also have a lot of pedals. Uh, my pedals are a big part of my compositional sound, like especially on my album, Broken Staircase, which you checked out. I'm using like every single pedal and I have like 10 pedals or something. I, I add on to my pedal board a lot and mm-hmm. playing the Mark bass. Yeah. 
So I'll come back to pedals, but strings. What kind of strings are you using? I use Federa brand strings, nickel, 45 to 100. Gotcha. Like a pretty light for the stuff I play, for the solo bass stuff. Yeah. And, and on my P bass, I use flat wounds. Mm -hmm. um, labella string. I use labella flat wound string. Same gauge. Any particular instrument cables? Nothing really in particular, but what, a cable I've been using now that I like a lot mm -hmm. is this cable. I don't know what it's called, but one side, it basically silences... Like if you plug out of your amp, it's, it's silent. I found it at this at this shop near where I live, and it's great. But yeah, I don't usually I don't, I don't really use a specific brand of cables. I just try to find whatever is recommended to me. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Well, there's there's so many components when it comes down to you know you've put all the effort into refining your instrument and the strings, but that sound has to get to that Mark Bass amp somehow, and and so. As time goes by, looking at cables more closely, you may notice some more differences. Also, if you're touring, the demands of touring, you need something that's sturdy and durable and is going to take a beating, whereas mm -hmm. other cables yeah. may not hold up so well. Interestingly yeah. enough, my first cable back, oh my gosh, way, 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 way back in the day, I picked it because it was a coiled cable. So it oh, kind of looked like those yeah. telephone yeah, cables. Yeah, 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 things are, yeah. And I just thought that was great, but it didn't right. have any other particular feature to it other than the fact that it kind of stretched out some and it pulled itself back in when you were closer to your amp. Yeah. So exactly. that, that was good enough for me at the time. With your pedal board, is there a particular pedal that you would go, this is it, my most important pedal that I absolutely have to have that I depend on the most oh yeah yeah for sure I have a huge pedal board but when I when I use on most of my gigs I bring a small pedal board that has like four of my like essential pedals or three of my pedals one of them is a what is it it's a it's a duality fuzz pedal made by dark glass that's one of one of the ones I always bring mm -hmm. I bring that one I bring an MXR envelope filter all the time and I bring a super octave deluxe uh, OC3. I, the reason I bring those combination of pedals is because we were talking about it earlier, the synth-based stuff. Using the octave and the envelope filter is like, it's a great way to sound like a synth, like a synth bass if you're not a synth player, you know? And so I think that's, that's always really important to bring the octave, the envelope filter. It really simulates a great, very close to a synth bass sound. So yeah, I try to get as close to a synth when I have to, basically. And looking ahead, what... Mm -hmm plans do you have what are you thinking looking in the future what, what what are you going to do i aspire to go to berkeley college of music and from there on I, I make connections there i want to do a lot of studio stuff session stuff i want to mainly be a session guy you know play with bands not exactly permanently but you know like like being an open agent to a lot of bands playing like you know two main bands that i'm in and then play with basically play with as many people as i can gotcha uh, and just sort of become known as somebody a guy you know the guy to call not necessarily extremely famous or anything, but the guy to call, you know. It'd be very humbling to feel like that guy. You know what I mean? There you go. Well, yeah. you know, there there certainly are players. I had the pleasure of chatting with Chuck Rainey. Oh and, wow, Chuck Rainey, yeah. Yeah. The guy's a freak. He he's the he he would be the one that you would say he's the guy that you call because he's recorded he's got, more right. than like anyone else. So Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. All those guys, Tony Levin. Yeah. That was one of my like inspirations. You know, James Jamerson. All those guys. Absolutely. Tim LaFave, you know, like a modern example, Tim LaFave is an yep. amazing, incredible bass player. Gotcha. Yeah, all those guys. So if people want to keep up on what you're doing, where's the best place to look? Social media? Social media, definitely Instagram. Just at Oliver Unger Bassist. First name, last name, Bassist. You know? And YouTube. I also have a YouTube, same thing, Oliver Unger Bassist. I post covers and original material on both of those things and things about gigs. When it comes to one of my gigs, it's all on there. So Instagram, at Oliver Unger Basis, same for YouTube. So yeah, that's where you can find me now. Excellent. Well, Oliver, we're very excited with your journey, kind of having a chance to chat with you now. Uh, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to chatting with you maybe 10 years from now. And, and oh, yeah, getting, yeah, doing yeah. a follow-up, and this way we've kind of got, this is our foundation, and we'll touch base mm -hmm. down the road. Folks, you've seen him here, Oliver Unger, coming to you live on Bass Musician Thank Magazine. You. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it, man. Mm -hmm.